Welcome to Imagine Wealth Without Risk, the podcast that guides you to fulfilling your dreams through guaranteed, secure investing. Here's your host, Ted Thomas. Hi, everyone. This is Ted Thomas, and I want to introduce you to Frank Rolf. And this is going to be a very exciting interview because this is something I don't know anything about. I've just heard about it, and now we finally found an expert. So we're going to both learn a lot today. So stay tuned. We'll be together for about 20 minutes and you're going to get a lot of information. Frank, tell us a little bit, a little bit about yourself. I should have listened to Dave DeVos broadcast first, but Dave's been a friend of mine for a number of years. He said you were the greatest. Sure. So I'm happy to have the greatest with us. So start right out and tell us about yourself and brag a little. Don't be humble. Okay. I appreciate that, Ted. Uh, I don't know if I'm the greatest or not. I do my best. I started a billboard company back straight out of college, built that up for 14 years, sold that to a public company, and then started buying mobile home parks back in 1996. Wow. And starting from scratch since that time, my partner Dave Reynolds and I have built up the fifth largest portfolio of mobile home parks in the U.S. So we have about 400 employees. We've got about 200 parks with about 20,000 lots, which means we have about 60 to 80,000 customers uh, spread out over about 24 states. That's amazing. My goodness. And you did that in, uh, what's that, about 20 years and a little bit? Good for you. Yeah, that's, that's about correct. Wow. Tell us about this. Do you like to call them manufactured homes or do you like to call them mobile homes? I don't like either name, to be honest with you, Ted. I, the industry has never been very good at public relations. The first name for the product was a trailer, oh, yeah. hence the word trailer park. Yeah. And then the word trailer went away, and it changed over to mobile home at about the time that the RV and the mobile home industry split up. That was in roughly the 1950s to 60s. And then the industry changed its name again in 1976 when HUD took over and started overseeing the manufacturing of all mobile homes. And then the name changed to manufactured home. The word manufactured isn't very appealing or not more appealing than the word mobile. So I kind of prefer just the word home or the term that we use, which is affordable housing. But at any well, rate, like affordable housing. It's never yeah, been very housing. Yeah. Actually, I live in a, a real nice neighborhood, but I just drive a mile not even a mile, and there's the cutest mobile home park you ever saw in your life. Oh, my goodness. Yep. Everybody has a little lawn. Everything's neat and tidy. Yep. Oh, it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, and I go there, and uh, yep. here in Florida from time to time we have hurricanes, and they did suffer some damage to their fencing and stuff. But other than that, gee, it's a really a nifty little park. I often thought to myself, gee, why don't those people advertise? They could probably get they could probably get even bigger ones, but it was really a nice little park. I don't know how many are there, maybe 100, 150, but... Wow, it's really maintained, beautiful landscaping, and I'm sure those people got to be happy. But anyway, yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, that Ted, because the industry is not what most people think. The average American stereotype of the industry is what they see on television, on shows like Cops or the movie Eight Mile with Eminem. Yeah. But the actual industry is more reminiscent of uh, single-family subdivisions, only at much higher density. We typically have about 12 to 15 mobile homes per acre, which is uh, far higher than most single family. Our customer base ranges, we have, there's five billionaires that own a mobile home. Now they don't necessarily live in it full time, but they're all in a mobile home park up in, up in the Hamptons called Montauk. Oh. And then you have uh, a couple of parks in uh, Malibu, Paradise Cove and Point Doom, which have really? a number of really? celebrities oh. in them. Yeah, uh, Hillary, oh. Hillary Duff is there. Sean Penn was there. Pam Anderson was there until recently. Oh. The industry is far more varied than people realize. I'm glad you pointed that out the, about the one that you've driven through because most people do not understand the product at all. Yeah, yeah. They could they could do some marketing and let the world know. I'm telling you, you I don't know anybody be embarrassed to live in this one, though, and I drive by. It's just really nifty. It's really a cute little yes. place. I always thought that the knock on them, uh, shows what I know, the knock on them was they just weren't big enough. These look like they're they, I guess you call them a double wide or something like that. I don't know the right terms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, d yeah. D double wides typically are well over a thousand square feet. They even make a, oh. a model that's over two thousand square feet. The, the the day the days of the tiny mobile home have gone the way of the buffalo. The early day homes were only two hundred and forty square feet, and now modern homes can go up to ten times that large. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. See, this is a great education. Now, a lot of people like these as investments. I've heard people talk about that. 
So tell yep. us about that. Sure. Like any form of real estate, at some point in the movie, people start realizing that it has some investment value. And mobile home parks, that time didn't really come until about the mid-1990s. So in the mid-1990s, Sam Zell started buying mobile home parks. He's the has been the largest apartment owner and largest office building owner in the U.S. Now he's the largest mobile home park owner. And at about that same time, I started buying parks. My partner Dave started buying parks. And what attracts people to mobile home parks are just a few very simple to understand items. The fir first is we are the only sector of real estate that's virtually an endangered species because they haven't allowed new parks to be built since about the 1960s. Most every mobile home park out there is half a century old and there aren't any new ones. There's about 10 in the entire United States built per year, but there's about 100 torn down every year. So we're actually a shrinking industry and that gives you a really good supply demand position. Really? And it also gives us a gigantic moat around the industry as Warren Buffett calls it, because since you can't build any new ones, the value of your mobile home park is set in stone. Don't worry about any new, new development going on. So that's really good. Next item people like is that affordable housing is hugely in demand pretty much throughout America. There's some small towns where they don't need it because stick built homes are like 30 grand. The average home in the U.S. is 200,000. The average mortgage is 350,000. And our little homes uh, typically sell anywhere from about $1,000 to not more than about $35,000. So we are the only non-subsidized form of affordable housing in the United States. Oh, yeah. And then another key reason people like it, obviously, is the finances. You're typically buying these things from the original mom and pop builder. And as a result, they, they're not really good on the pricing. They typically sell them cheap with a lot of room to push up the rents. And then they also carry the financing frequently. That's how I got in the business until my partner did. We were fascinated by the concept of buying assets with the seller providing the financing. It Absolutely. didn't make a lot of sense to us why you'd even do that, but people have. And then over time, and now that our interest rates are so low, with CDs paying under 2%, it's not that hard to get mom and pops to carry the paper because they typically get 5%. What? But those, those are the key reasons probably why people started investing in them. Let's, let's take a step back. You'll know all this history. You said a name that, of course, rang a bell with me right away. I'm an old timer. You said, I know who Sam Zell is out of Chicago. Yep. This guy is, uh, he, he's uh, very innovative and um, he knows, uh, he's, what did Rockefeller say? Buy when there's blood in the streets or something like that. <laughs> Sam yeah, Zell right. certainly knows that business because I was in the apartment business for, for a number of years, got up to about 4,000 units and then, then the market reversed. And so you already know mm -hmm. the rest of that story. And anyway, Sam Zell was there to buy those things for 30 cents on the dollar. And you say he's the biggest owner of mobile homes. So that t tells you a lot about what the investment environment should be. Uh, pretty darn good. Yeah, in fact, let's put, put that in perspective. We're, we're fifth largest at 20,000 lots. Sam Zell owns about 160,000 lots. Wow. So he, he is nearly 10 times as large as we are right. through his publicly traded REIT called ELS. Yeah. All right, let me ask you, a, it's going to be a dumb question for you, but it's for me. Uh, so why don't they build mobile home parks anymore? That's a great question because people talking about it frequently, but what people don't talk about is the reality of what's going on. Mobile home parks are huge money losers for cities. So if you oh. take a typical 100-space mobile home park, and let's assume that half the folks in there have at least one uh, kid going to school, and that means you'd have 10000 uh, per kid per year of school cost, a half a million dollars of drain on the city's coffers with that little mobile home park. But yet that mobile home park will only pay property tax on the lot. Let's say the lots are assessed at 40000 apiece, and you're in Missouri, which is a 1% state. So you'd have 400 of tax on the lot, and you'd have maybe $50 of tax on the home. So they are getting in, they're getting in about uh, forty five thousand in that example of property tax, and they're spending half a million. So they, the cities, which are all broke at this point, they can't afford to lose money, right? And then every other option you can build on a mobile home park, they make money. So if you build self storage, it doesn't cost the city a penny. They get property tax. It, it's uh, it, that's the problem. So cities have hated this stuff for decades, but yet they can't stop it because mobile home parks are grandfathered. So they yeah. basically cross their fingers and hope someone will redevelop it. And then the way they also get around the, the federal government's mandate that they're supposed to provide affordable housing is they don't have any mobile home zoning. They've, they've removed it all. Every city doesn't have 
anything zoned mobile home. To get that, you have to get a variance. And what they do is they energize the public to come in and speak poorly of the idea, and then oh. they blame not passing it on the public, when in fact it's really them because they don't want to spend the money. It's a fantastically orchestrated con game that's been going on now for half a century. Wow, that's terrible. Well, so that's, uh, let's uh, just talk about that for a second. Uh, uh, I normally wouldn't do this, but uh, I, I admire what you, you've just said. Isn't this perfect for senior citizens? Yes, it is. But right now, probably the growing segment of the industry is not senior. It's family. So a lot of people don't want to build senior dedicated 55-plus parks. They want to build what are called all-age community. Oh, so see, if you were it. to build a new park, it would pretty much have to be senior. In fact, I imagine that the 10 or so that are built each year probably are senior. Yeah. But the problem is that the people building parks, they don't want to build senior because you have a much smaller slice of the pie as far as potential residents. I see. Okay. Because well, I live in Florida and 20, 22, 25% of a population has got white hair and whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, so, that's, 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 that's true of Florida. But if you go over just one state in any direction. Yeah. Uh, you'll find it's a more youthful market, but but yes, it was a good observation. Yes, the senior, senior yeah. park would 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 remove the school cost. That's correct. Yeah, I know the school bus doesn't go in there. That's for sure. I've never seen it. <laughs> that's <laughs> correct. <laughs> okay, so I I got it. Okay, good. All right. So what have uh, what what do you do? You just uh, go out and look for these uh, opportunities to buy these parks and then either rehabilitate them or what do you do with them? Just we call our well. model bringing old mobile home parks back to life. And so that's what we do. So just like somebody buys an old car and restores it, we buy old parks and restore those. So we typically go in and redo the infrastructure off in the road, sometimes water, sewer, and electrical. Oh, like and then we bring back what we call pride of ownership. So a lot of these parks, what happened was the people had pride in what they had, but as the park went down the drain on its own com common areas, they, they lost their own fervor to keep the property up. So when we start bringing them back, then the residents start bringing their stuff back. Nice. And at some point in the movie, maybe six months out or three years out, the park is re-energized and comes back out as a nicer community, sometimes as nice as it was when they built it. Yeah. So it's an art form, but that's our model. We're just always buying old mobile home parks and bringing them back to life. You're a fixer-upper guy. How about that? Oh, that's terrific. Yep, that's really, yep. that's really good. And uh, is there uh, is, is there a huge amount of the, of rehabilitation going on, or is it just you? you that's your your specialty. No, there just about everyone who buys a park is in the uh, turnaround business because almost all the parks are broken in some form or fashion. There's just oh. not that many people in the industry still. There's forty four thousand parks in the U.S. There's only four thousand of those that are what we would call professionally owned. So it's still 90% mom and pops. Oh, I see. And of course, the only way they can get out is sell it to you and carry the paper, right? <laughs> Amazing. No, that's not the only way. That is the uh, preferred way for many because they would rather get 5% than 2%. But right. the banking is very strong in our industry, thanks to Sam Zell. And then thanks to the fact that we either have each year the lowest or next to lowest default rate in the U.S. So banks are really? our low being very safe. Yeah, it's one unknown that rarely gets talked about, but because our tenant base is so stable and because banks don't ever go wild and crazy with mobile home parks, they rarely default. I, I don't know the stats on how many have defaulted historically. It's an incredibly small number. There's very few mobile home park REO deals. Yeah. And so what I have a, a number of listeners and uh, what can we do to help you? The, there's really nothing to help me. I think probably what I would talk about for a moment is just the outreach program that we have been doing for about a decade now of talking and teaching about, about the industry, mainly to try and dispel the wrong stereotype and to help bring the industry up to mainstream real estate because it really should be up there with apartments and other forms of multifamily, but we're like the, the relative everyone's embarrassed of that has locked in the closet. And so we're trying to get out the word that the industry is actually pretty interesting and has a lot of opportunity in it. Yeah. It's like the guy that runs the trash company, right? He doesn't have anything to brag about. You smell the old trash truck, but they sure make money. I noticed they, they all get new trucks every year and these guys all get a retirement yeah. after 20 years and whatever. So somebody's making a lot that's of correct. money somewhere along the line. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So, so to help, help the cause, we have a website called MHU dot com, which stands for mobilehomeuniversity.com. 
Really? And uh, if you go to the site, it, it's got a ton of free content. It's got a forum, all kinds of stuff as we try and take the mystery and dispel the stereotypes out of the, uh, the mobile home park and the affordable housing sector. Yeah. And what about the manufacturers? You get a lot of support from them or how does that work out? It's really a strange relationship because manufacturers and the park owners are in some ways have the same vision, but in some ways we're at odds. Mobile homes, the, ho- the homes themselves never die as long as they're maintained. Oh. So when you have a mobile home park that's totally full, Right. You don't really need any mobile homes. So you can actually have the park industry doing well while the manufacturers are struggling. What's happened now is about half of every mobile home in the United States that's built is purchased by a mobile home park owner who then brings it into their mobile home park to sell or rent it. So yeah. in many ways, mobile home park owners have been the savior of the manufacturing side of the business because we're the biggest customer. But at the same time, there have been periods in history when the manufacturers have done terribly. At the same time, the park owners have done incredibly well. So we're affiliated, but our business model is completely different. Yeah. Manufacturing is so scary today. You go to go into a bad cycle and you got all that factory and all the uh, trained workers and all that equipment. My goodness, that's uh, talk about Yeah, hiring. and I will tell you, it's an interesting uh, fact that most people don't know, but Warren Buffett is the largest manufacturer of mobile homes. Through, right. through the company known as Clayton, and earned, owned by Berkshire Hathaway. Right. So we've got Sam, Sam Zell's our largest park owner, and we've got Warren Buffett as our largest manufacturer and, these yeah, guys and financier of homes. These guys look for big profits. They look for upside. They, they're amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, well, well, you're, yeah you're, it, it, it is crazy. You've got a kind of a hidden industry here that the rest of the world doesn't even know about. And yep, I, yep. I've never known sure. anybody like yourself, so this is, this is quite interesting. So where do you sure. go from here? Where do you go in this business? Uh, well, we're not trying to buy up the earth. We're probably not going to expand wildly bigger than we are now. To get from where we are now up one uh-huh. spot, if we wanted to go to fourth position, we would have to grow to about 50,000 lots. Oh, that's huge. Which sounds, sounds, yeah, that's huge. And right now, our fourth position company, which is called Yes Communities, is owned by GIC, which is a sovereign nation fund of Singapore. As crazy as it sounds, the country of Singapore owns the fourth largest mobile home park portfolio. And then the number third position is owned by Brookfield, which is a Canadian REIT. So the Canadians own the third largest portfolio. And then you have two public REITs that are number one and number two. Number one is ELS at Samzell, and then number two is Sun Community. So we're almost an international business now because yeah. of the top four. Two of the four are not in the United States. They're getting nice rates of return. That's what they're looking for is rate of return. They're not yep, standing that correct. thing very long if they're not getting good rates of return. Wow, that's, that's yep, pretty that's amazing. that's correct. Yeah. So how many, new, how many new homes are manufactured here? Do you know that kind of number? The Zenith was about 400,000 units in about 1998, 1999. Today, they're only producing right around 100,000 or fewer. And the worst the industry ever has been is about 60,000 units in the mid-2000s. So we're right now on manufacturing. We're not the all-time worst, but we're very low. The old standard steady rate back in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s was about 200,000 units or so. But what happened in our industry is that we get no support from the government. We're not subsidized, and our customers typically have really checkered credit off in cases and not a lot down. So no one wants to make loans to them. So the only way people buy mobile homes today is the park owner has to step in and, and do it for them. And so that's what's really slowed the manufacturing down. But they, ho- they hope at one point uh, the government will get back in the business, but until then, with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac not actively engaged in the retail side, it's really hard for people to buy mobile homes. Yeah, I can see that. Wow, gee, that's a, this amazing business you got yourself in here. <laughs> Did you know all this when you started? No, I, the only reason I bought my first park was I got it for $400,000 with $10,000 down, and the seller carried 390000 for 30 years. Wow. That's the only wow. reason I got it. Oh, my offer I could not refuse. Yeah, and offer then, I couldn't refuse. My, par- my partner's... So you got on-the-job yeah. training? Is that what you got for the first five years? That's exactly correct. Oh, I had wow. no greater knowledge of a mobile home park than any other American and oh. nothing but negative stereotypes. Oh, I had to, had to yeah. learn, learn from that as I went. And so what do you do? Do you have investors with you do this, or you, you guys do it all out of cash flow? 
because of our size these days, we're, we're what's called a Reg D 506 B and C fund. So we have many investors in it today, but in the early days, it was just us. Just the, just the two of you. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. Yep. Wow. This is pretty exciting. What else would you like to me to know? Oh my God. I, I don't know what else I, that, I, that the listeners would like to hear. Again, if you're interested in the sector, I invite people to go on mhu.com, it's mobilehomeuniversity.com. Uh, there's a lot of free content on there. You can subscribe to our monthly newsletter. You can read the hundreds and hundreds of postings on the forum. We have a book about the industry we wrote. There's a course on it. There's even a, a live boot camp that we do. Oh. Again, we're just trying to spread the truth about the industry and how to properly do it and get rid of all those negative stereotypes that the media has been building about the industry now for decades. Yeah. Now, how, how many people get to come to your boot camp? We typically have anywhere from about 60 to 100 people per class. Right. And they range about ha half of the people already own parks and want to learn how to do it better. Half of the people are looking at buying a park. But even in that subset, we have a lot of bankers. We get appraisers. We get a lot of people in the media. We've had the New York Times. We've had uh, the whole bunch of uh, newspapers, television, National Geographic, very, various people there. We're pr pretty much all there just because they're trying to learn more about the industry, and it's the only class in the United States about the mobile home park business. So uh, we kind of have a monopoly on that. And so we reach a wide range of people just interested in that whole sector. Oh, I bet. I bet. I've often thought it was a, a good investment. Now I'm convinced that it's a good investment. And it doesn't sound like anybody's charging ahead trying to get in it. So they probably want to attend your, learn a lot just by going to that class, at that with that workshop that you're doing. So how would people uh, find out more about the workshop again? Let's do, put that address out one more time. Sure, sure. Just go out to uh, www.m, as in Mary, H as in Harry, U as in university.com, which stands for mobilehomeuniversity.com. Mobile and you go to that site and it's got, it's very easy to navigate and you can see how you can get whatever information you're, you're looking for. So okay. it's and not, so if they not just hard, wanted, to, hard to find. I'm sorry I interrupted you there. Yeah, so if they just wanted to be an investor with you, could they find that on that website? They can't because we haven't been taking investments, new investments for a while, but you can still certainly learn how to do it. And, uh, and there are other people out there who do have their own mobile home park funds. It's just, we're no longer doing that, but there's, you're, there's you're, other people. You're are. close to investors, but you're open to uh, students. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I will, I will continue regardless of what we're doing on the, on our day job on the business side. And we'll always continue to try and push the industry forward since there's hardly anyone doing that. And yeah. so, yeah, we've tried, we, we see ourselves just as a, as an outreach program to people to, to show them, that the industry exists and then what it's really about, which has nothing to do with, most, with what most people think. So what will you do in the future? Will you roll that up into something Sam Zell has or will you, how will you, how will you uh, what's your exit strategy? We don't really know. Right now our main focus is trying to fill our vacant lots. We've got about, I think around 3,000 lots to go until we're to totally full. Then raise our rents in line with the market. We're trying to work on property condition. We're building a lot of new amenities for residents. When we get done with that, I don't know. Our options, because of our size, are somewhat limited. There's only four people larger. At some point, we could sell off uh, one, one, one or more properties as, as groups to different people. Uh, we may just hold it in perpetuity. We could even theoretically, we're big enough to go public in Canada. So I don't know. I, we don't know what we're going to do right now. We're just focusing on getting the parks as good as they can be, and then we'll figure that out here in the years ahead. You sure a great spokesman, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you, you go right there. You, you got every answer right on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing yeah. things and I'm hemming and hawing. And I, <laughs> I love to listen to a guy like you. You really know what you're talking about. Thank well, you. I want to thank you. If there's anything else you'd like to, to say, I'd, I'd like to hear it. But boy, I love the background you gave me. And who knows, we get some responses. But we might be just, just be calling you back and you talk more about mobile homes. Uh, should a guy start well, out with sure. a tour or should he buy a park? Well, there are people who start out in the mobile home space doing what are called Lonnie dealers, which is named after a guy named Lonnie Scruggs who wrote a book back in the 80s called Deals on Wheels. That, oh. that, that's not really where the big money is. The, the people are far better off buying the mobile home parks because what's, what you want is you want to be in the land business, not right. in the home business. Right. So mobile home parks is all about basically it's like a big parking lot 
Right. So the rent you get is real property income, but the home is, is personal property income and you can't cap it and it's not treated the same. So I would urge most people to try and get in the park business, even if it's small, even if it's a 10 space park, 15 space park, you'll still be way ahead if you get in the land business as opposed to the home business. Wow. Great advice. Great advice. One last time, tell us how they can contact you. And uh, I, once again, I'll thank you. Sure. All you have to do is just go get on the computer, go to www.mobilehomeuniversity.com, or we made it simple. We have the domain MHU, and then you can navigate. There's tons of free content, a lot of concepts you can read about, learn about on there. There's a forum, book, course, boot camp, whatever you want. If you're interested in the industry or if you just want to learn more about the truth of the industry and dispel the stereotype, then you just go to mhu.com and everything you want is right there. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And uh, you jammed a lot into uh, 30 minutes, that's for sure. You got a lot in that uh, podcast. So good to talk with you and uh, I wish you lots of luck on your adventure. Thank you for joining us today. Go to tedthomas.com to learn how you can start making smart, secure investments today. Be sure to check out the rest of the episode to find out more about Imagine Wealth Without Risk.